יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונקה. יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Known as the Aaronic Blessing is quoted from Numbers chapter 6 verse 23 to 27. And today I want to focus upon the Aaronic Blessing and the concept of what it means to bless and the benefits of blessing. The ironic blessing is not just a prayer to end a service with. It's a very powerful and life-changing prayer. In Numbers 6, the Lord told Moses how to bless his people, Israel. He said in verse 23, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. He then gave the words of the blessing. And then the Lord says in verse 27, So shall they put my name on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. The ironic blessing was to be the way to place the Lord's name actually on Israel. Think about that for a moment. It was placing his name on the whole nation. The word El is short for Elohim, and his name is in their name, Israel. And he identifies with them. He calls himself the God of Israel. And that raises the question, what about us Gentile believers? During lockdowns, the blessing became the most recorded and sung song. Nation after nation did their own version of the blessing, which is the ironic blessing. When Christians say or sing the, the ironic blessing, does it also release a blessing? Does it place the Lord's name on us? And we will pursue these questions today. Another area to pursue did you know there's a connection between the meaning of Bendigo and the ironic blessing? We'll come to that too. And to bless is the opposite of what it means to curse, of which scripture often contrasts. Matthew 5, 44, Jesus said, Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Romans 12, 12 says, don't give up in a time of trouble, but commune with God at all times. Speak blessing, not cursing over those who reject and persecute you. And Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So Deuteronomy 28 contains all the blessings to Israel if they obey God and then all the curses if they disobey. And so basically to bless releases life, hope and a future, multiplication, divine order, things going well. To curse is like a seed which reaps a deadly harvest. In our series on Romans, we spoke about the sowing and reaping of wrong attitudes to Israel, especially the blessing versus curse in Genesis 12. But there's much more to the meaning of, of blessing than we think of in English. In Hebrew, the word is borak. And it's used in two ways. One is us blessing God, particularly in worship and praise. It means to kneel, to praise, to salute, to adore, to thank, to congratulate. It implies we're blessing God as an act of adoration and worship. But the other is God blessing man in the form of a benefit, to bless abundantly, to prosper, to be fruitful, to speak well of, and to thank. So we're going to start today and we're going to listen to one of those versions of the blessing. This one's a symphonic version from the Passion City Church. He is with you. He is for you. Morning, noon and night. Bless the Lord. The first mention of the word bless is God blessing us in Genesis. On the fifth day of creation, God made sea creatures and birds and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. On the sixth day of creation, God made mankind and says in verse 27 of Genesis 1, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We see the blessing right there embedded in 
creation, in multiplication, in being fruitful and multiplying. In the opposite, the word curse, which is a violent expression of evil upon others, is first mentioned in Genesis 3 after the fall. So God's intention is to bless us, but the fall introduced an unintended situation of curse. And in verse 14, it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this in seducing Adam and Eve, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. So what are we made from? Dust. And so when we operate in our flesh rather than the Holy Spirit, the devil has permission to eat us. And if you're feeling rather devout, do a check. Are you reaping fleshly activity? But it's quite a confronting thought there that the curse is for the, for the enemy to be crawling on the dust, but eating dust. So then Adam in, experienced a curse because he followed his wife to eat the forbidden tree. Verse 17 of Genesis 3. Then he said to Adam, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it, both thorns and thistles or weeds. It shall bring forth for you and you shall eat the herb of the field. So blessings give life, favor, growth, joy, shalom, multiplication. Curses are destructive, makes life much harder, as in the soil of the ground and working, brings desolation, hard yakka, and even death. But the choice is ours. As Israel was going into the promised land, the Lord gave them many instructions. In Deuteronomy 11, verse 26, he says, Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Verse 27, the blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. Verse 28, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord. So Deuteronomy 28 gives the exact nature of those blessings and curses. And there's a lot of verses in that chapter. And then Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live that you may love the lord your god obey his voice cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days that you may dwell in the land which the lord swore or covenanted to your fathers to abraham isaac and jacob the lord gives the choice freedom of choice is from god but he urges us and says we should prefer and select life. And then says you do this with your tongue. Proverbs 18.21 says death and life are in the power of the tongue. And hence the importance of the grumble fast of the book that I put together to help us to allow our tongue to bless, to bless God, to bless ourselves and to bless one another. After the flood, Noah built an altar to worship the Lord, and the Lord then blessed Noah and his family. But soon after, his son Canaan saw or sinned against his father's naked body, and Canaan was cursed. Interesting, it's the land of Canaan that Abram is then sent to possess as an inheritance from the Lord. But Abraham's blessing is conditional again and tied to covenant. Abram had to first leave his country and follow the Lord, even though he didn't know where he was going. But he first had to obey and act upon the instruction that God had given him. Then he would be blessed. Genesis 12 verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land I will show you. I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So to activate the blessing, Abram had to obey in a very practical way. He had to leave the country of his birth. And the covenant and the blessing was then conditional. Our blessing is also conditional and it's also obedience. In the Roman series that we did, I spoke about the attitude towards Israel that the blessing comes to those who bless Israel. 
which is to honour, to speak well of, to be great, grateful for, to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But we would experience cursing if we even despise or are contemptuous or scorn or deride Israel even in our hearts. So covenant is a key to blessing, not just Abraham's covenant, but the new covenant by Jesus as the Passover lamb. I just want to mention one thing which I know trips people up. Jesus said we should bless those who persecute us. And I know there's been times in my life, there's been difficult situations and you go, how can I bless that person? And I had people come to me, we we're having this discussion. And I asked the Lord one day about these tricky situations. When everything inside of you does not want to bless, how do you bless somebody? And the Lord gave me this understanding that I read out from Deuteronomy. And it says, he will bless you if you are obedient to him. And he showed me that if somebody is persecuting you or there's a difficult situation, if you bless them, you are actually releasing all that God has so that they can obey the Lord. And isn't that what we want for everybody? Mm. No matter what they're doing to us, we want them to obey the Lord. And the only way you can um, come into the blessing of the Lord is through obedience for Abram and for us. And so no matter what the situation is where Jesus said to bless them, it's getting us off the hook of bitterness and unforgiveness. But it's also uh, releasing all that needs to take place so that that person can step into the fullness. And I've seen uh, amazing things that God has done to bless people in that space. So while you think about those things, we're going to um, join with Matt Redman in 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. You know, when we are really blessing the Lord, we can do nothing but sing like we've never sung before. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, the background to the ironic blessing is the Israelites were in the Sinai wilderness and God was giving them instructions for their new desert lifestyle as free people, freed from Egypt, and especially about worshipping him. He instigates the covenant. He calls them to choose life. And the ironic blessing is part of the directives of the duties of the high priest. Now, remember that point, because I'm going to come to that in a moment for us. Because what about for Christians? Should we pray it? Should we sing it? As grafted in Gentiles, we can take part in the promises extended to Israel and gain nourishment from the same root system from which they thrive, God himself, as I spoke in the Roman series, we are grafted in to the olive tree. I want to tell you the story of Warren Marcus. He's the author of the book, The Priestly Prayer of the Blessing. He's a filmmaker and a producer of the Sid Roth It's Supernatural program. Warren's friend um, by the name of Rick phoned him one day and he'd seen an ancient pendant, pendant in Jerusalem and he was so overwhelmed, he was weeping on the phone. And he said, this pendant is 400 years older than the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what's etched into it is ancient Paleo-Hebrew. And he said, it's the prayer in number six. And he said, when it was prayed over me in the Hebrew language, it felt like honey, oil being dripped from my head to my feet. And my life has changed. His name is upon me. And Warren's like, what's he talking about? This Gentile is reading the Old Testament and I'm a Jew. Why aren't I being affected? I've had that prayer said over me by other people. I've had that prayer pronounced and it's a beautiful prayer, but I didn't have that experience. And here's my friend, Rick, who's a Gentile. And look at the experience he's having. Talk about being made jealous. And even when he said he received Yeshua, he could sense him personally but the father I knew about the father but I didn't know him and God says he will put his name upon those that say this prayer and in the Hebrew his understanding was that he put his presence upon whoever speaks it so when God puts his presence on the Jewish people for 40 years in the desert what did that mean as far as blessings well Israel in the desert received incredible favor they received angelic protection they had provision of manna, quail and water. For 40 years, their shoes and clothes never wore out. 
They had no medicines, no stores to go to. It was a barren desert and they didn't have lots of vehicles to carry them. And so you could see right through those 40 years, God really blessed them, even though it was tough. His friend told him that the prayer had been prayed over him in Hebrew. So he thought maybe we're missing something in the translation. Maybe the Hebrew is something that we're missing in English. So Warren began to pray the prayer over himself in Hebrew. And he, be, he had a vision and encounter. All of a sudden he said, I sensed this face was in front of me. I could see eyes. I could see a mouth. All of a sudden I felt the father. And I said, father. And it was like a breath came to me. It was like when he breathed, Adam came to life. And I didn't want to lose this. I realized it was the heavenly father. I could have a relationship with Shura. I could have an experiential supernatural relationship with the Holy Spirit. and But I could also have a specific encounter with the Father. And when you have access to the Father, he gives you an impartation of himself. And so he really concluded that the Hebrew has a far deeper meaning. And so he really dug deep into it. And that's where he wrote the book. And he says this, the Jewish high priest had to pronounce this prayer over Israel. We have a high priest. His name is Jesus, or Yeshua in Hebrew. And he's there 24-7 in the glory. And he's praying for us, it says in Hebrews. Consider Jesus pronouncing this blessing over you and me to place his name upon us. When we are redeemed, we not only have a new nature, but by his blood, he makes us holy. As high priest, Jesus intercedes for us and he pronounces the blessing over us and places his name on us. In Revelation 22, there's a picture of God, of the river of God. And it says there in uh, chapter 22, verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And so it's a, it's a concept that follows through from the Old Testament through to the New Testament. So Karen Davis sings the name of the Lord. You mean the name of the Lord is a powerful name. Well, what does the name of Bendigo have to do with the ironic blessing? In Spanish, Bendigo means I bless. God has blessed this city with natural riches, but he's also releasing the spiritual blessings on the city. Yet there's contention, there was contention over its name way back. And name always has a lot to do with our destiny. So if the Lord's name is upon us, that's really important to come into the destiny that God has for us. So originally the contention was between the name Sandhurst and Bendigo. Sandhurst means a sandy thicket of trees and it was actually a seat of military training in the UK. So we were either to be a real blessing, not just the gold, or a thicket of trees, which there's a lot of trees here. We know the history was that Mount Alexander, there was a chap who was nicknamed after the English bare knuckle boxer by the name of Abednego. And the, the local lad in Mount Alexander must have got into fights like the guy in e England. But the English bare knuckle boxer Abednego was one of three triplets and his mother named after the, th the three triplets from the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And Abednego became an alcoholic, but after being locked up 28 times, he turned to the Lord and became a preacher. And we don't really know the story of the local chap who was a bit of a fighter, but his nickname was Abednego and was corrupted to Bendigo. And it really is a picture of gold has to go through fire to be purified. And the three boys in the book of Daniel went through the fire, but the Lord was with them. He was with them in the fire. They were tested not to bow down to idols. And that's a real picture for us here in Bendigo of not to bow down to idols. We may go through the fire, but fire is needed to refine and purify gold. And so there was a, a prophet came through Bendigo many years ago, 
and had a word for the city that where the past was in natural gold, the future is in the gold of his glory, of his presence. And the worshippers in this city would be refined in the fire and they would export the fire to others. So in Prebendigo around the year 2000, we could often said the city was called, we were blessed to be a blessing. And there was much prayer in that respect for the city to be a blessing. But in the year 2010, when we went to Israel for the first time, we were on Mount Carmel and there was a group of believers from Mexico. And one of the men, a Sephardic Jew, was very interested when he heard we were from Bendigo because it's in the Spanish language. And he asked to see it written down. And when he saw it, he was very excited. He said, the word is an ancient Hebrew word. And in the ancient Hebrew, it means I bless you or God blesses you which is the beginning of the ironic blessing, the Lord bless you. And so this is a really powerful connection for our city to release the ironic blessing over all the inhabitants of the city, but the city is as a general and, and to go there. Now, another little piece, this might be a section of what you might think is trivia, but it's very important. So for those that are Star Trek fans, you'll remember the Vulcan salute. Well, it's actually nabbed as a one-handed gesture instead of two-handed from the priestly blessing that God told Aaron and his sons to recite in number six. Apparently, the actor was asked for a sign and he's, he is a Jewish man and he decided to use uh, the salute that is used as the priest, high priest, would uh, speak the ironic blessing. And each hand forms the shape of the Hebrew letter Shin, the first letter of Shaddai, thus imparting the name of God to the people. It is Shaddai that is given. And through this gesture, gesture, the name imparted to us is the motherly, nurturing, loving, providing giver of blessing. So isn't that just special little tidbits on there? So the Lord bless you in the ancient Hebrew really implies May your heavenly father, he who exists, kneel in front of you. Because it actually means, the word Borug, means to kneel. He kneels in front of you to make himself available. Now, when I first read this from what was written about this, I was very challenged. Why would God kneel before us? Why would he kneel before me? But he then explains it in this way. Like a father kneels before his little children to open his arms and invite them to come running into the arms. Who of us as parents or grandparents have not with our little children opened out, got down on our knees, opened our arms and call them by their name as they come running into your arms. And what a beautiful picture of the heavenly father kneeling before us, his little children to minister to us, to comfort us, to bless us, to love us and to extend the, promises over us the first portion of the priestly prayer our father making himself available to each one of us it demands a response from us or do we ignore him when we put our arms out to our children or grandchildren it would be very heartbreaking if they didn't run into our arms but what a beautiful thing it is when they do run into our arms and we just hug them and kiss them and and love on them and so this is really a picture of what that first phrase means. And then it says, and keep you. So the Lord bless you and keep you. May the heavenly father who exists guard you with the hedge of thorny protection. In Hebrew, the word hamar carries the idea of guarding. A shepherd in the wilderness would build a corral to protect his sheep from predators. The Lord keeps us from danger and protects us from the enemy. Furthermore, nothing can separate us from God, it says in Romans 8.38. So his arms going around us in a divine embrace will prevent Satan and all our enemies from harming our body, soul, mind and spirit. What do we need? Deliverance? Healing? It comes because we're in his presence, in his embrace, in his arms. And as he kneels before us to bless us we kneel before him to bless him and so there was a global song put out together we bow low beautiful song there we bow low and that's really what 
Barak means to kneel before the Lord in worship. And as we're going through this ironic blessing, we looked at the, the Lord bless you and keep you. And now we come to the Lord make his face shine upon you. His face in Hebrew is the word panim, and it means to turn his face and make himself available to us. It's not just his face of the eyes, mouth, nose, but his entire being. God provides all of himself to us. He's not a distant idea, but a fully divine person with thoughts, judgments, and emotions. And so as we hear this prayer, we need to really receive the fullness of what it means. And then it says, make his face to shine upon you. In Hebraic thought, light is order and darkness is chaos. As in Genesis 1, when the Lord said, let there be light and light divided from the darkness because light brings order from darkness and chaos. And spiritually, this happens when we see his face or his panim because his face is the source of illumination of light. It says in Revelation that there's no need of other light or electricity in heaven because it says the Lamb of God is the light. And so our Heavenly Father would illuminate the wholeness of his being towards us so we would fulfill our God-given destiny and purpose. And then it comes to the line, and be gracious to you. The Hebrew word for gracious is chanan, and it's used in the Bible. We see a picture of true grace, like when Israel rebelled, God loved them and drew them on. And he loves us despite our failures and flaws. This prayer isn't based upon how good or how perfect we are. The children of Israel weren't deserving of this either, and neither are we. This prayer is not based on cheap grace. Remember, I talked about that in the Roman series. Simply the Father is looking into your eyes, his smile of pleasure. He loves you. And this is where he's saying, I love you, my daughter. I love you, my son. I am well pleased with you. He sees you as his created one. It is good. You are good. The difference between being a good creation and holy. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are good. You have been made in his image. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. In Hebrew is Nassar. It means to lift up and to carry you. This is the Heavenly Father lifting you up like a child. Remember with that child image, you open your arms to the children and then you lift them up. You stand up and lift them up like the child is carried in their arms. And he supports us with his divine embraces and his entire being. In the same way, God is for us with his entire being. We are also called to be for God with our entire being. We must love the Lord with our, all our heart and all our soul and all our might and give you peace. We know the word is shalom in Hebrew. It's much more than the absence of war or chaos. It's to restore something and make it even better than its former or original state. The Heavenly Father sets in place all that we need to be whole and complete so we could walk in victory by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's to give us supernatural health, peace, welfare, safety, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfection, fullness, rest, harmony, as well as the absence of agitation and discord with nothing missing. He restores us to a right relationship with him through the, the gift of forgiveness and justification. He is able to restore earthly relationships and can even restore days and years that have been lost to the effects of sin, the eating of the, of the locust. So again, listen to the Shafar and the ironic blessing. Let it be prayed over you in Hebrew and in English and receive the fullness of the blessing of it today. יברכך אדוני וישמרך, יאר אדוני פניו אליך ויחונקה, יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I pray that today you're able to receive the fullness of that blessing in the understanding. To bless is so powerful. As Jesus said, bless those who persecute you. Regardless of whether a person has caused us harm or not, blessing someone who's in a bad place releases the power of God over them. It helps them to walk in obedience to the Lord, to walk into their destiny. The power of God into our own hearts about the situation and releases the Lord's goodness, his mercy and hope into their life. So I pray today that you'll be able to release a blessing into the lives of those around you, to bless them and not curse them, to release blessing, to release life, to release hope, to release destiny, that all that God wants for them, but also probably what you want for them as well, because that's what comes when we bless and not curse. Karen Davis sings, Behold His Glory. So whether this is for yourself or whether this is for somebody else in your life, I pray today that you would be blessed with joy. You would be blessed with shalom, that you would walk in the fullness of destiny, that you would be freed of all angst, freedom of all chains, of all besetting sins, that you would know him that you would know the Father's love filling every crack within your soul, that you would know his comfort, you would know his security, you would know his presence, you would know his abundant joy, and you would be fruitful and you would multiply in all the areas of your life that he has called you to, that you would be in alignment with his heart, his favour and his grace. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.